It needs to be said that as I'm recording this, it's like 30 degrees outside. So it's probably like 30 to 33 degrees in here. <sighs> These recordings normally take about 40 minutes to do. <sighs> I don't know if I'll last that long. We shall see. Is it safe to say that field watches have become one of our guilty pleasures? These excellent little machines that many see as great entry-level offerings, but the die-hard enthusiasts also chase, whether modern or vintage. And what defines a field watch, relatively small in size by today's standards? A simple design, usually only displaying the time. Legible, lightweight, slim in profile. Now the field watch originally was designated to people who operated, military personnel who operated in the field, hence the name field watch. But there's also a gray area that I want to discuss by the end of this video, so I'll be sure to leave timestamps in the description. And I want to talk about brands like Rolex, Tudor and Omega and how they factor into this equation. I stand by this when I say that the field watch is arguably one of the best pieces that you could add to your collection. Not only are they relatively affordable and have a great variance in price, but they also give you that mill spec built for function instead of fashion aesthetic that I think a lot of us enjoy. Now a shameless plug, I have just started a new channel, it's called Idea, linked at the top of the screen. It's a place where I talk about anything but watches and it fits very nicely into this subject because I'm just about to put a video up on the page about the first tank, the Mark series of tanks made by the British during the Great War. So it works into this scenario quite nicely and if you like the presenting style, I'm sure you will enjoy a bit of history and a bit of discussion around design over there. The support from all of you on that side has been amazing and I cannot thank you enough, those who have subscribed and joined the channel. It's flattering, I honestly cannot thank you enough. The question is, are field watches practical today? I think more than anything else, they offer us quite a nostalgia trip. Unlike models today that are polished and brushed, expertly finished and oversized, these manage to reconnect us with an older time and style. And I completely forgot what's on my wrist, Smith's W10 from 1970. So the thought for this video was to go through a list of pieces that I made that make for some of the greatest modern field watches that money can buy you today. From Seiko's to IWC's and then of course at the end, the grey area that I want to discuss more. Now it needs to be said that we will be looking at modern field watches, not focusing on micro brands but rather the more recognisable names. And that we won't be looking at vintage models because if we were, I'd be sitting here for about an hour discussing them at length. Maybe we can do that another day. So let's have some fun. First watch I chose in this category is the Seiko 5. I mean, who doesn't like a good Seiko 5? But there are so many variances in this category, it's very hard to choose just one. I decided to go for the most modern iteration that you can currently get. There's the SNK381K1, the SNX, I've got to look at my notes, 427. But the model that I want to talk about is the SRPG 35K1. Yeah, got it. You will see quite a split between American inspired designs and British inspired designs. And it's very easy to tell the difference between the two as we run through the video. But this example of Seiko takes inspiration from Hamilton, from Benrus, from marathon pieces, all using 24 hour time at the base of the dial. This is something that the American armed forces have always required post the Second World War, and it's a format that has lasted an extremely long time. Now it's not up to me to question whether or not this configuration clutters the dial, that is up to you. But with an example of a watch like this, you're getting a Seiko 5, you're getting an automatic movement, very affordable price, day-date complication, and then it's everything else. It's the case not being polished, the lugs very true to form, the handset chosen. It's a great looking piece, tons of variations out there, so check them out. The next up is the Timex Camper 36mm. This watch is a far more true to form model of a watch that belongs in the 1960s. Same kind of configuration, American inspired dial. But what I love most about this piece is the handset they decided to go with. These white painted stick hands look so good and balance out that dial nicely. As well as the original Timex font, the fact that you can even get these pieces in plastic cases. And I would say arguably these are the most affordable watches you can get on this list. You can get them in mechanical or quartz, and it's so good to see that Timex still has this watch in their catalog. They even have the traditional military green. But then we jump to the two legends in this category, the Hamilton car key, Field, Mechanical, and the Hamilton Pilot Pioneer. What's so great about these two watches is they are completely distinct from one another. One is the American inspired dial, the other one is the British inspired variation. The Hamilton car key is a piece that doesn't need an introduction. It's a classic, always will be. 
and I think this piece just carries on that tradition so well. Everything from the large crown that sticks out from the side of the case to the soft beige patina on the hands and the plots. And as we know, there are millions of variations to look into with this example, some with sapphire crystals, others with acrylic. And then we hop over to the Pilot Pioneer, which is a model that takes its inspiration from the original Hamilton W10, a piece that was issued just after the Smith's W10 was phased out. And this one adopts the British styling of field watch design, which is more true to the Dirty Dozen, a far simpler layout, much less complex, but has a few quirks and cues that makes it extremely exciting, like the triangle at the 12 o'clock position, the quarter batons, how they break up the dial so nicely, the larger numerals, which makes reading quicker. And then you have these fat, broad arrow hands that adds more to the equation. And it needs to be said that when we look at these two watches separately, one is more 60s inspired, the other is more 70s inspired, a theme that's going to carry on throughout the video. The Marathon GPM is an unsung hero in this category. Marathon pieces in general don't receive the same you know, admiration and appreciation that brands like Hamilton do. Difficult to understand why. I mean, Marathon is a Canadian brand. They have just as much, the same amount of heritage as brands like Hamilton and Benrus do. But Marathon as a brand has such a unique selling point with how their pieces are put together. They use tritium tubes, which means that over the course of tritium's life, which is about 12 years, it's going to glow extremely well. It's not going to need exposure to sunlight, but it also means that as it ages, so the tritium will age with it. This is quite a different departure away from the traditional American spec dial because we see that it uses a 40s inspired handset. These syringe hands are a little bit more old school, but they also aid in legibility. Then you look to the case of this watch and it's pulling from the 1980s with a fat boy case, something we will touch on in a moment. Overall, you're getting such a good package with this watch. Not only is it a piece that is still currently an issue and being used, but it's this amalgamation of parts from different eras, as well as bringing you a unique selling point like modern tritium. And of all the pieces that we are covering in this video, I think the GPM deserves a lot more love. Now, if we want that nostalgia trip, the Benrus DTU 2A slash P reissue is a really cool little watch. We must bear in mind that during the 60s when these watches were commissioned to be made, both Benrus and Hamilton contributed in the contract. But what made the Benrus pieces more unique is that they were sterile dials. So it's a little bit more stealth, a little bit more under the radar, but you still see the typical American field watch display. I must commend how these watches are so nicely balanced out, and I really enjoy the cases used on these Benrus models. The pointed lugs on the cases look stunning, and they correspond with the pointed handset chosen. And if I had the choice of choosing an American configuration field watch of this caliber that has more of a reissue flair that's a bit more old school inspired, this Benrus is the one I would be going after. Now to CWC, known as the Cabot Watch Company, was a brand that surfaced just after Hamilton left, after making pieces for the British Armed Forces, basically took all the surplus parts that were left behind, fitted them primarily with quartz movements, and issued them, and still do issue them, to the British Armed Forces, even to this day. The CWC G10 Fatboy is a 1980s inspired field watch. The peculiar 1980s case of this watch always gets me. It's a love it or hate it thing. It was quite a severe departure away from the 70s inspired cushion cases, and an even further departure away from the 60s cases that a lot of us know and love. But these were some of the first quartz CWCs, and even to this day, still being produced, great little watches. But my favorite in this category is the CWC Melo Mechanical Auto. Now this piece pulls inspiration directly from the CWC G10, I believe they were called. And a funny callback, these use the cases that belonged to the original Hamilton W10s, the mechanical pilot pioneer that we've just looked at. So we see that there is a lot of interweaving. There's a lot of use of surplus parts, surplus ideas, as these designs get older and older. But here we see a watch that is a lot more true to form to the original CWC. Just a great wearing watch. I think the way they've balanced out the proportions and the sizes of how it wears on the wrist. Now, maybe I am the wrong person to ask because I am very biased to designs of this kind, but I find them to be such captivating designs. These dials are some of my favorites. Now, Longines and their Heritage Collection. Can't go very long without talking about them. The Heritage Military, also known as the piece that was issued to the RAF. A callback to a 1940s inspired model, a very rare piece in this category. This piece was introduced at a time where function and beauty really meshed so well together. And you can see it virtually everywhere, from the handsets to the numerals chosen. Now Longines has even gone further by adding speckling to the dial, which simulates the oxidation that these dials would experience over the years. Now granted, when we compare this watch to the models that we've just seen, it looks sparse, it looks spare of detail, but I think every element that they wanted to address, like the crown usage, the handset, 
The way that the lugs form around the case and the spacing and size of this watch, which is about 38 and a half millimeters, it's very well done. More recently though, Longines introduced another heritage model, but this one belongs to the Marine Nationale. This was a piece that was introduced in the 1950s. So where that last watch was in the early 40s to late 40s, this is now early 1950s. And here we see a piece that clearly does have 1940s aesthetics when you look to its dial. Especially seeing how the numerals run around this ruler styled minute track. But their attention to detail once again is amazing. Not only have they faded the color of the dial to give it more of an eggshell finish, but they've even gone so far to make the loom inside the hands black. Quite a peculiar choice. I believe the reason why they did this, this was originally a piece given to the French Navy. These watches were at sea. I'm sure they were exposed to a lot of moisture. And how moisture affects radium is very different to how it affects tritium. So. You know, the models that they obviously used as examples had similar loom like this. Personally, if I was given the choice between the two, I would be looking at the original Heritage Military. I think it's a little bit more exciting. But then again, for a field watch, you might want something a little bit more restrained. And this is another option. Finally from Longines is the Spirit Collection, and I've chosen the Spirit Titanium as the sample here. This takes the elements that we have just seen from those first two pieces and brings it together into a modern example of a watch, now using a titanium case, far lighter, far more modern, but still has all the drawers from vintage inspired pieces. The Spirit Titanium is just a fantastic watch. I have received so many positive testimonials from people who own them, who wear them as daily drivers. And as far as a field watch goes, I mean, it's hard to really fault it. Now we move into a completely different realm where we look at models like the IWC Spitfire and the current released IWC Mark 20. I've just done a video about that watch. If you'd like to see it, I'll put the link in the corner of the screen. Both of these models and the many variations that IWC offers us pulls their inspiration from aviation pieces, obviously. But where most of these watches in the lineup have looked at either British or American inspired dials, so IWC borrows inspiration more from British and German inspired pilot watches. Most of these field watches that IWC offers follows more along the lines of a Flieger aesthetic. And you can see that inspiration belongs everywhere. When you look to the handsets, the typeface chosen. Arguably, we could say that these are the most expensive field watches that money can buy you today. And it's questioning whether or not these watches deserve to be in this category because they are so highly priced for being typical field watches. But that leads very nicely into this next subject, which is the gray area. And that's returning back to the beginning of this video, which was defining what the field watch is today. And we think about it as a watch that's legible, minimalist, simple, slim in profile. Why is it then that Tudor, Omega, Rolex don't get factored into this equation? The Tudor Ranger, for example, could that not be seen as Tudor's field watch? This piece has all the hallmarks. In fact, it's marketed as an expedition watch. Why shouldn't it be called a field watch? How about the Omega Railmaster? An extremely underrated watch. Also a piece that doesn't have a date complication, simple arrangement. And yes, it is a watch that does lean more towards being an engineer's watch, but we look at it on the outside and it has many elements that we could say belongs to the field watch genre. And then of course, the grail of expedition watches, the Rolex Explorer. Could this not be categorized as a field watch today? If we break down the term exploring, adventuring, being in the field, out in the middle of nowhere, this piece also has a lot of that original field watch in its DNA. So the summary of this video is that you can find a watch in this genre, in this category, for any price that you could imagine. We can see very clearly that there is a distinct theme that field watches abide by and follow. But when we look to modern pieces today, I think there is also a thread that we can see clearly links to traditional field watches. And even though there is a strict standard and requirement for what defines a field watch, I think today we could use it a lot more loosely. Field watches truly are some of the most amazing pieces. They offer you everything and more. Great starter watches, great pieces for those who are experienced. They are fantastic watches to introduce people into this hobby. There is this underlying theme that they all follow and abide by. Small in size, water resistant, rugged and tough. But their designs could go in so many directions. But the best part of all is that they remain eternal.